good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. So I'm here today to talk to you about artificial intelligence, how it's going to transform and change the world, but even more importantly, what are some issues uh, around it and what we should be careful about and what we should think through before we kind of dive too deep. So really, um, what is new about artificial intelligence? If you think around in the last few years, the software has evolved to, to allow us very different capabilities. So the first capability that we have is around sensing, which means we can perceive and collect data about the world uh, around us. Then we have the ability to analyze and comprehend this data for, to, un to understand it, to extract meaning and insights uh, from it. And then the last thing that is important is that based on this meaning and insights, we can act, right? So we can sense, we can understand, and we can act. But what is important with the emergence of uh, artificial intelligence is that there is one more step, right? That, that this acting is not pre-coded or hard-coded, but that the systems can autonomously learn and adapt and improve over time. So this notion of learning is essential to excitement around artificial intelligence today. And while we had systems that can learn and improve over time for many, for many, many years, there is also another kind of phase transition happening that allow us to take these systems and, and put them to the next level. So why can we do these things today and why couldn't we do them before? The first important thing is that there are three different uh, factors that allow us to do this. First one comes from the notion of sensing that I was telling you before. So basically, today we are witnessing digital transformation where we are a society and a science generating lots and lots of data, right? So basically, everything we do, we do with the help of digital devices. So all the data we are generating um, is digital. So this means we have lots of data and you can use this data to train the systems, right? The systems need to learn and to learn, they need examples. And data provides them an opportunity with plenty of examples from which these AI systems can learn. Now, if you want to be able to learn, you need examples, but you also need a machine that is able to kind of store the knowledge. And in the last few years, there has been great advancements in terms of building these deep, large neural networks that take the input data on, on the left, on the input layer, and then through a series of complex mathematical transformations, transform it to the, to the desired output or to, to a desired prediction or to a desired um, decision. So we have made great progress in making up, kind of coming up with new mathematical, statistical uh, machine learning tools. And then there is the last component that is essential to make all this work is the compute, right? It's not enough to have the data. It's not enough to have mathematics, but you need to be able to connect data and, and mathematics, and you do it through uh, computers. And we have made great advancements, both in terms of new computing architectures, um, as well as software systems that allow us to compute in data centers over very, very large scale, right? So now, uh, given that this is new and exciting, I want to give you a quick um, rundown or a br brief intuition. How does this technology work? How, how can you make machines learn, right? So how can I understand uh, the magic? And the basic paradigm is amazingly simple. It's basically idea is to learn from massive data. And if you think about how a kid learns, it learns by trial and error. Right? And machines learn in the same way. And basically, data provides us with lots of examples of, of uh, correct uh, decisions or with correct outputs. Right? So the idea is that we will be given many examples where we want to connect some input and map it to some output. Right? So if I think about image classification and I want to distinguish apples from cherries, then I will need lots and lots of examples of images with cherries, and I need to know that those are cherries, and I will need lots of examples of images of apples to be able to learn how to connect the image of an apple to the label uh, apple. Right? And now, what goes in between to be able to map this input as an image to the output as the label of the image is a, is a large neural network where um, basically this network will learn how to take the image 
and make a prediction about what's the type of this image, right? So a bit more details is that basically on the input of this network, we will bring in input variables, features. For example, for images, we can bring in small patches of that image. And then through a series of complex mathematical uh, transformations going through this set of uh, layers, at the end, we will come up to an output. And in our case, if we want to distinguish cherries from uh, apples, we would have two output nodes, right? The top node uh, on the output layer would light up whenever we put in a cherry uh, on the left, and the apple node would light up whenever we put in an apple, right? And that's essentially the idea. The idea is to kind of create this network, this wiring diagram that takes the image on the left, transforms the information, and then one of the two nodes uh, to on the right lights up basically has a high value. And of course, in reality, these networks are not only you know, two layers, three layers deep, but they have 50 and more layers. And they have tens of thousands of these nodes, also called neurons. And then, how does the network learn? The way the network learn is that whenever we put in an image of a cherry on the input, we let it propagate through this uh, network. If, if the, if the, if the answer that comes out on the other side is wrong, then we ba basically backward propagate and say, how do we change the weights, the connections of this network to make it give us the right answer? And if I give you enough examples of apples and enough examples of cherries, then we can figure out how to learn this basically wiring diagram that transforms the image to one of two values, right? whether it's an apple or whether it's an orange. So given this small example, um, what are some consequences if we think about being able to learn from lots of uh, examples and lots of data? So the first thing is, if we want to be able to do these things, we need lots and lots of data. right? We need lots and lots of examples of image of a something comma label. And you can think the same way, for example, if you want to do medical diagnostics, you could say, on the input, I need patient characteristic. On the output, I want to be able to predict what the disease the patient has. Or if I want to have a self-driving car, on the input, I get the, sensors, the, the, sen the sensor inputs from the, from the car. And on the output, I want to know whether I should you know, press the throttle or should I brake? Should I turn left or should I turn right? right? So the principle is always the same. We want to map the input data to some kind of output uh, decision. And of course, the model can only be, or this AI can only be as good as the data is good. So it's amazingly important that we have high quality data, that data is unbiased, that it's complete, and that it is representative um, of the world uh, around us. That's the first important consequence. Another important consequence is that we need knowledge, infrastructure, tools to be able to build, train, and deploy uh, these models. And right now in the Valley, it is one of the most sought after skills is people who, who have the knowledge how to be able to do these things. And then I think one more important consequence is that may not be obvious and many times gets overlooked is that this is not a silver bullet, right? It's not just that you take some data, train your network, and, and, and you can go um, uh, sit in the shade, right? We really need everyone to work together in organizations, right? So that we can assure that these deployments of this technology are both actionable, fair, uh, and transparent. So in some sense, the issue of AI, it's far beyond the technical problem of learning from large scale uh, data, but it's also thinking about the environment these technologies uh, are going to disrupt. So what are some examples of the areas where artificial intelligence is going to bring a disruption. The first one is intelligent automation, right? So basically, this, this technology will allow us to kind of far enhance tradi traditional uh, automation solutions, right? And you can even think that self-driving cars are example of intelligent automation, just one small example, right? Um, and this means that as this technology progresses, we'll be able to automate more and more complex tasks uh, that require more adaptability and agility, which means that basically human workers will, ha will, uh, will be able to focus on more complex tasks and really on the tasks where they provide most value, right? Um, and what is important is that if this technology works well, it should get better over time. It should learn from its own mistakes to improve over time. So that's one example. Another example 
is that this technology should allow us to make better decisions, right? In some sense, they, sh they should allow us to, or they will allow us to enhance our judgment. And, and you can think that basically when today humans make decisions, we are quite biased, inconsistent, and we don't have complete information. So by building these systems that can collect and, and analyze lots of information, we can hope to achieve more consistent, more transparent, fairer, and more efficient uh, decisions, right? And what this means is that we can then train humans to really focus on the parts where they can provide most value or the AI technologies can help them uh, in some kind of complementary way to make uh, decisions. And then uh, the third area where there will be impact or where there is impact is in terms of intelligent products and intelligent kind of customer human-human interactions. And here you can think anything from smart chatbots and call centers to systems that allow, that automatically answer questions to customers uh, to other, other examples where basically radical personalization and processing of real-time information makes the people user experience uh, much, much better. Um, so that is number three. And then number four is really about uh, trust and safety, right? These systems are amazingly good linking together small, seemingly disconnected pieces of in information and kind of building up a bigger picture. And they can go through much more information than a single human or lots of humans can do. So this means that these technologies um, are really useful for fraud detection, enhancing, let's say, financial controls, um, and better risk management. Right? And this also means, because these systems are, are deterministic, they will help us with better governments as well as uh, transparency. So how is this going to change the workforce? How do we think this will impact uh, uh, us as people? Right? The, what I think is that basically the changes to jobs and workforce will happen because AI is going to tackle complex activities and then employees, people, can kind of transfer to less mundane and more uh, rewarding tasks. So what this means is that for the conse consequences of our jobs, it will basically expand the scope of them into higher complexity and more rewarding activities. Because basically we'll be able to train AI to automate lots of things uh, for us. Another consequence that will happen is that skills will become more transferable. Right? Because there will be smaller barrier to entry because the AI is going to abstract kind of domain or work-based specifics into, some, into something more uh, higher level. And then the last um, important point is that this will be creating new positions, new roles, and new jobs that we are not even aware uh, today. And what also means is that the workforce will have to be much more agile and will have to learn and adapt much quicker than, than we used to. And what I want to do in the remaining uh, of my talk, I actually want to guide you through one use case of how AI could be deployed today and what kind of consequences and important issues uh, we have to think about uh, to do that. And this will really be about the research we have done uh, at Stanford together with my colleagues uh, at Harvard, University of Chicago, and uh, Cornell. And we were looking at how could AI be used to enhance our judgment, to allow us to make better decisions. So if we think about um, human-driven decision-making, there are many areas of society where humans make decisions today. E we have examples in the healthcare, where a doctor makes a decision about the treatment. In education, as a professor, I make decisions about which students require additional attentions and uh, what kind of interventions I can do for students to learn better. And also in criminal justice, let's say judges are constantly deciding who to release on bail or not. Right? And if what I've been saying is, is true, then these types of technologies, AI technologies, should allow us um, or give us the opportunity to improve these types of uh, important decision-making decision in uh, society and public policy. But of course, there are many complexities, challenges, and subtleties when we are trying to do that. Right? So really, in some sense, the question is how can we make humans and machines uh, work together? Because they nicely complement each other. 
right? In some sense, there is information asymmetry in a sense that humans tend to see more than what machines do, in a sense that human can talk to, the, to, the, uh, to another human, they can ask them questions, and this way learn and feel the other person, if you think a doctor in, of a doctor in a hospital. On the other hand, we also know that humans are kind of notoriously biased and inconsistent when making decisions. Right? So, how, so there seems to be a good opportunity to combine and work together to be able to make better decisions. So what we were motivated with was to say, you know, how do we facilitate better human-machine collaboration to enable decision making? As a, and as an example, I will show you one, one, one use case of a very important um, decision making um, case that uh, we are all facing today. Right? So the way this goes is the following. We'll be looking at criminal court bail decisions. Right? And in the United States, police makes, makes around 12 million uh, arrests per year. And the question is, where, do, where does the arrested person, where do they wait for trial? And the judge basically decides whether to let that person out on bail to be free while waiting for the trial, or the judge decides to put them in jail. And if the judge decides to put the person on, on bail, then bad things can happen. And basically, there are two types of bad outcomes, right? The person who was let out on bail can either uh, fail to appear at the trial, and uh, they can commit more crime while waiting uh, for the trial of the, of the, for the first arrest, right? So what is really the question that the judge is asking? It's asking, will the defendant misbehave if I release them out on bail? And what is this? This is really just a prediction problem about what is the future behavior of the defendant going to be. And just note that we are not asking whether the person is guilty or not, and so on. And in the case of bail decisions, actually the law is very clear. It says that the judge should pay, t uh, should pay uh, no attention to the level of crime, but only what is the probability of them failing to appear at the trial. So it's really making a prediction about future, de future behavior of the, of the defendant. So, great, how, will, how are we going to do this? I already taught you how to do that, right? We will build a model that can go and, um, and take uh, the defendant characteristics as the input. Um, we, we will train this neural network, then on the, on the output will tell us the probability that if we release this defendant, they are going to misbehave, right? They will either fail to appear or commit uh, more crime, right? So the way this will work, is basically that we will take lots of historic data about people that were released and whether they misbehaved or not, whether they committed more crime or not. We will build uh, an, uh, a learning algorithm that will basically identify the patterns of how, which people tend to uh, break bail, and this will basically give us a predictive model. And the idea then is that when a next person comes in, um, we will let this p uh, the characteristics of this person through our predictive model, and the model will basically predict, um, are they going to commit crime if released on bail or not? And if the prediction is crime, then the idea is we would put this person in jail, and if the prediction is no crime, we would uh, release this person and, uh, on bail and let them uh, go free. Okay, so let's, let's try to go through this exercise and continue. So the first important question is, what kind of variables, signals, are we going to use to describe these defendants, right? Uh, this becomes interesting because certain signals are illegal. So for example, you cannot use the race or religion as an input to your predictive model. But then also there is all kinds of questions about can the defendants gain the, the signals, the features you are entering into these systems. So what we decided to do is to, to use kind of these common administrative variables, like what's the age at first arrest, what is the level of charge, and so on and so forth. And the only way to gain these things is basically not to do crime, which is what we want anyway, okay? So this is on the input. Now, the machine needs to be able to learn, so it needs to have lots of data about uh, people who got arrested, released on bail, and whether they committed crime. So we were working with 360,000 cases from the state of Kentucky and around 1.1 million cases from the federal pretrial system. And what, we, what you can l learn from this table is that today humans, human judges release around 73% of the people and that their error rate is around 17%, right? 17% of released people commit more crime. About 10% fail to appear at the trial, around 4% commit another non-violent crime, and around 3% actually commit violent crimes while waiting for the trial 
of the, of the first crime they got arrested for. Okay? So this all sounds great, right? We could just fire up our machinery and life would be good. Um, but there is a fundamental problem, if you, right? And this fundamental problem is that the judges, through their decisions, are, sel are hiding or selectively labeling the data for us. Basically, what I'm trying to say is if a judge puts someone in jail, then we don't know whether that person would, would break the bail or not. We only know whether the person misbehaves if they are actually released. And this means that only a biased subsample of people is released, right? Because the judge is not making random decisions. And actually, this can lead to huge overestimation into the confidence of these AI machine learning systems, right? So let me give you an example how we could make big mistakes, right? And the issue we call about is, is called selective labels because the judge is selectively labeling the data, right? Imagine the following is true. Imagine that young people whose family shows up at the court commit no crime. They don't break bail. And the judge is smart and wise, learns this rule, and releases people deterministically whether you know, the, the family showed up at the court or not. Right? But imagine that the algorithm, the machine, does not observe this signal was the family present at the court. Right? Nobody thought to code for it to enter it into, into the system. So based on the release defendants, what the algorithm will learn is that all young people commit no crime. And, right, and what is now the issue? The issue is that we basically the, the algorithm based on this data will falsely learn or presume that by releasing all young people, it does better than the human judge. Right? So the question is, how do we guard against it? How can we build algorithms that don't fail under this uh, very simple uh, uh, example and actually give truly give us uh, good good decisions and we have developed a method that basic that builds on the idea that there is variability between different human judges and the idea is that you can take a very lenient human judge that releases lots of people and then apply um, uh, a learning algorithm on top of that to basically artificially contract um, and make this human judge stricter so that then we can compare the performance of this artificially strict human judge with the, with the performance or the error rate of a real strict human judge. And this way, it allows us to fairly compare the, the error rate of the algorithm and the judge. So let me show you how well this works, right? So here's a plot. X-axis is number of people or a fraction of people we release, and Y-axis is the crime rate. Uh, and we know two points of, on this graph. The first point we know is the red dot, which is basically where the human judges are today. Release 73% of the people, and their error rate, the crime rate, is 17%. Another point we know about is 0-0. Zero, zero. Basically, if we would put everyone in jail, then nobody could commit crime. So if we release 0, we get 0 crime rate. Right? Um, and the reason why I gave you these two points is because, really, this is we can be anywhere on this, on this line, right? So in some sense, we are choosing a society, we are choosing a threshold or what is acceptable crime rate and how many people we want to release. So the question becomes, what is the curve for the, for the uh, machine decision making in this case? And here is the curve, right? That is the error rate of the, of the algorithm as a function of the number of people uh, we want to release. So for example, if you want to keep the release rate the same as uh, human judges have today, we would be able to drop the crime rate by 40%. Um, if we would want to say we are happy with the crime rate we have in the society today, we could actually release many, many more people. So our jails would get emptier. And um, this is quite interesting because it shows us basically that we can be anywhere on this trade-off line between the number of people we release versus the amount of crime we have. So what I also want to show you is that actually these things are not so complicated, right? I was showing you about these complex neural networks. So the question here is, how complex is this model? How hard is this thing to do? And actually, we develop technology that finds very simple human interpretable rules that work amazingly well. So basically, if you are able to memorize these eight rules, you will do 23% better than the judges do today, right? And you can look at these rules, are, are anyone can see them, it's easy to memorize, and they use very simple characteristics of the, of the defendant, mostly about what was the arrest and what was their previous criminal behavior, and there is something ab about age. And that's it, right? So by sifting through those data, 
we learned these eight rules, and it would actually allow us humans to make better decisions. So let me briefly uh, conclude. Right? So what I presented is kind of a new tool that allows us to make uh, and improve our decision making. And it can be used on many different domains, and the criminal um, uh, uh, bail decision making is just one example. Right? So what it shows is that AI can really be used for this high stakes decision making and would improve the way we are making these decisions. But what is also very, very important is that we think about how AI might be misused and abused. And it's important to think about these issues from the beginning, not as an afterthought. Right? And we have to think of these algorithms to basically help us diagnose bias and, and make humans make better decisions. So let me t talk briefly about some of the issues, right, if we would go and deploy this. First thing is that um, the data responds to the, to the model, right? As the AI would be making decisions, the outcomes we would observe would be a consequence of those decisions. And we get these self-reinforcing feedback loops that we have to be very careful about. Another important issue is that when we build this, when we train AI systems, we have to tell them what the, uh, what the desired outcome is, right? And in this case of criminal um, courts, you can ask, is minimizing the, the crime rate, even though this, this is what the law says, is this the right thing to do, right? In a sense that there are big consequences for jailing someone um, in terms of family, there are uh, consequences for jobs and family, and uh, also for future behavior of the defendant. So how could we make sure that the decisions the AI makes are just? And then I think what is the most important is that how do we build this method so that we trust them and that they are responsibly used, right? And I think the important thing is to put human in the center and make sure that these technologies are compatible uh, with humans that are either using them or being affected by them. I think it's extremely important to, do, to, to develop AI in an ethical way and comply with ethical standards and make sure that when we do these things, we do them in a the transparent way, that it's clear, for example, what the bail decision-making model is. I showed it on one slide, for example. And then, of course, what is important is that these are not only technological problems, but that basically the government regulations and, and basically public sentiment have to evolve as we are making more progress and taking these methods and deploying it to the, um, uh, to the society. But I think what is most important is to think about this as, as tools and basically tools that help us humans be more efficient and better, right? And if we have this view, then I think uh, life will be great. Um, thank you so much.